Good evening, church. Today is a special day. It is Good Friday. That 2,000 years ago, something amazing happened. And ever since every single day, on this particular day of the year, we are reminded that we all believe in a God that loves us. A God that not only loves us, but a God that is willing to die for us. Now, not only was he willing to die for us, uh, he was not just the old talk, no walk. Because 2,000 years ago, he came and he walked the talk. 2,000 years ago, this God took on human form, became a human being, understood us, felt our pain, and willingly offered up himself to die on the cross on behalf of our sins. And I always say this as an evangelist, wherever I go, if there's any gods out there, should you decide to follow? Hands down, it has to be this God. Because it's so hard. In fact, you can look up and uh, up, you can look high and low. You can look all four corners of the world. You can never find another God that is similar to this God. Because every time we look at the cross, we are reminded of two things. Number one, of his love for us. Number two, that this is an empty cross. So you don't see Jesus still hanging up there, do you? So the great news is that he died and he rose again after three days. I love to worship a living God. I would hate it to love a dead loving God. Today we worship a loving and a, a, a God that is alive. Now today is also special uh, because this is my second time back here in Church of Praise, Jehovah Ru. This is a beautiful church. Amen. For those who belong to Church of Praise, let's give yourself a big hand, all right? This is also a special day because I, I hope that uh, s there's certain people that I invited uh, did turn up. Now, can I just have a quick shout out? Is Huang here today? Huang, you like Now, he told me he was going to turn up. Huang, are you here? Oh, unfortunately, maybe tomorrow, hopefully tomorrow. Okay. Now, Huang is my, um, the guy who cuts my hair, all right? <laughs> he works just around at the end of the block, you know, so I invited him to turn up today. He's, he's going to come, you know, but I don't know what happened, but that is okay. But I'm also really glad because uh, here in, front, in the front row, that's, that, that is not my wife, by the way, that is my daughter. Okay, <laughs> they look at us and think, "Wow, this pastor has got a really young wife." You know, that has happened before because when I worked with her in a shopping mall, you know, and sometimes we, they have this bridal um, uh, photo shoot or whatever, and they say, "Excuse me, sir, you want to take a photo with your fiance?" I said, "No, this is my daughter. <laughs> uh, my wife, she is working tonight, unfortunately, so she can't make it, but she do sends her regards to all of you." Now, right in front here, this young man, this this guy in black, this is my son. And uh, Christian, would, would you like to stand up as well together with Emily? Let's give them a big hand. All right, you can take a seat. And I'm so glad that Christian brought his classmate. Okay, Xiongbin, you want to stand up? Let's, I'm going to give you a big welcome. There you are. Okay. This is Xiongbin's first time to a church. So I'm really glad, all right? So shower him with some love, will you guys? Now, I've been praying long and hard about what I should share tonight. And I thought, why not I share about my walk with God? That how I have experienced this God on a personal level. That from that point onwards, which was many, many years ago, that I've received many gifts from God. But at the end of my sharing, this is my personal testimony, I want to assure all of you here tonight that God has prepared a gift for every single one of us here. So nobody leaves this room tonight empty-handed. If you haven't received this gift from God yet, Make sure you grab one on your way out. Promise me that you're going to do that, or at least consider doing that. See, my journey with God began when I was a little boy, 12 years old. For those who do not know, I grew up in a small town in Johor called Sagamat. Anybody here from Sagamat? Right there at the back. Nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. Good, good. Let's have a little chat after the service, all right? We'd love to know where you lived or which street you were on. It's a, it's a very small town. Now, I lived right across the um, district hospital. Okay, for those who come from, from uh, Sagama would know that now the new hospital has moved to a new place, but it used to be on Jala Muar. And my house was directly across uh, from this district hospital. As a little kid, I grew up in the 70s. Uh, yep, I'm pretty old, I know. <laughs> uh, there, there, there ain't much to do as a little kid back then. I still remember as a little kid, I had three favorite things that I would do. Number one, I love playing football. Rain or shine, I'm, I'm, I'm always out on the field playing football with my friends. But if I, I didn't find any 
to a river behind my house, which is about 150 yards, where I would go and do fishing and swimming there. The third thing I would do, I was, I was conveniently a Buddhist, simply because diagonally from my house, across from my house, about uh, 50 meters away, was a Chinese temple. So those were the three things I grew up doing, playing football, playing along the river, or going to the temple. So I grew up as a Buddhist. Now, I was the only Buddhist in my family. I was a very devout Buddhist. At the age of 11, I got really immersed into Buddhism because I would go out to the temples, I would hang out with the Buddhists. I would imitate them, I would consider myself an apprentice to them, and I would learn all the tricks that they do with the incense and so on. I thought it was, it's pretty cool. So one day, uh, when I was about 11 years old plus, I went home and I told my dad, I said, hey dad, I figured out what I want to be when I grow up. Of course, my dad was really uh, curious to find out, and he asked me, what would you like to be when you grow up? I said, I want to be a monk. My dad slapped me on the head. You know, if you become a monk, you, you, you cannot feed yourself when you grow up. It's not a career path that you should choose. So my dad knocked some senses into me, but I continued to go to the temple. So much so that I came back, I kept bugging my dad. I said, hey, dad, I really love this whole Buddhism thing. In fact, you know what? I want to have my own altar. Please, 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 please. I said, I begged him day after day after day. Eventually, you know, that just, that just softened his heart and he, he caved in. So he's, he made me a promise. He said, Victor, when you turn 12 years old, you know, I'll get you your altar. I told my dad, he said, I want this altar in my room. Personal use, all right? I don't want to share with you guys. You know, I like people these days, you know, people, uh, you, you have a collection of devices or iPhones, so to speak, you know, from iPhone 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, you know, skip 9, 10 kind of thing, all, you know, all laid out on your altar. We didn't have gadgets back then, so I wanted to have gods. So I wanted to have different collection of different gods in my room. And I have a list of gods that I was going to go through. After I purchase this god, I'm going to get this other god and that other god. So that was my aspiration. So just before I turned 12, you know, I thank God that God really had mercy on me. Because what happened just a few months before that uh, was both my older sisters were invited to church. The really old church in Sagama, the Methodist church. Now I heard that my sister, when they went to church, they became Christians. Okay? They came back. And then they, they tried to bring me to church. I was very reluctant. I said, you know what, sis? I'm a Buddhist, you know. You're a Christian, you know. You know. I don't even understand it. The stream water don't disturb the hosui, cheng sui. The well water and stream water, they don't mix. Or the river, they don't mix, right, I say. But, you know, out of, out of respect, my sister's one was four years older than I am. One is five years. I had to go. They dragged me to church, right? So I went, all right? But I went with my heart closed, you know? I went with a lot of, I, I was on guard. So what happened was that when I went to that Friday night service, it was a youth service, I sat at the very last row. I didn't want to get involved. I just sat right there. I folded my hand and put on my long face. I said, don't talk to me. All right? I don't want to get to know you Christians, so to speak. So the night went on. I, I hear people sing. I hear people clap. I, hear them raise their, I see them raise their hand. Then I see someone walk to the front. I don't know who he was, a leader, a pastor, a bishop, a priest. I don't know. They did the whole talk thingy. And when the whole night was over, okay, done. I went back. Nothing happened. But my sisters kept dragging me to church, keep dragging me to church. Now, every time I go to church, you know, I would just be so closed up, you know, because I say, I know what you guys want to do. You guys want to convert me, all right? So every time they were singing songs and praying, you know what I was doing in my heart? I was chanting. I was chanting my Buddhism chant. So whatever you guys are going to throw at me, I'm going to siam, siam, you know. If you guys don't hock in, right, you know, I'm going to avoid, you know, left, right, center, so you guys cannot hit me. But about two months in, all right, I still remember vividly that there was a team that came from KL. They came, they did, they put up a skit. They sang some beautiful songs and so on. I thought nothing special with that. But you know what? That was the night something amazing happened. Because for the first time in my life, I experienced something that I've never experienced before. I felt a touch from heaven. I felt a touch from God himself. See, let me give you a little bit of backdrop. I grew up in Sagamat. I was involved in gangsterism. I fought a lot as a little kid. I, was, I wasn't very good with my words. I wasn't very articulate. Whenever I lose
is a conversation, I say, let's not talk, let's talk no more, let's talk to my fist. Okay, I was that kind of person. And what didn't really help was this. Sometimes I would get in a fight. Most of the time I would win, okay, because I was fairly big. But sometimes when I would lose in some fights and I would go home and there are bruises on my face or in, there was once I lost a tooth, okay, a whack. And I had a bruise in my, in my eye. Um, went home while we were eating, my dad noticed and he said, did you get in a fight? I was really afraid. I said, yes, dad. And then he asked me, did you win or lose? Uh, <laughs> so that, that wasn't very helpful, you know. I, like, I said, I won, dad. And he said, yeah, you know, kind of thing. So I grew up involved in a lot of fights and everywhere that I went. So I never understood acceptance. I didn't have real friends. In fact, when I was at school, I had a lot of mods. You know, everywhere I went, there were 20, 20 to 30 people walking behind me. Okay, because I was the kind of person, if you, if you don't agree with me, I would just whack you up, you know. So they, they wanted to be safe, so they'd rather stand on my side than to stand across from me. That wherever I went from in school, people were just walking behind me, my fans, so to speak. But they, the reason they, they were with me is not because they liked me, but because they were afraid of me. So you can, un, you can, you can almost imagine growing up as a, this rowdy, angry little boy, I didn't know friendship. I didn't know acceptance. I don't know what love is, right? Really angry little boy, very violent. But on that night when God touched me, I felt a kind of acceptance that I never felt before. I felt a kind of warmth, a kind of love that's just celestial. I was thinking to myself, this cannot be from planet Earth. It's just so amazing. So amazing that I began crying. I began boiling my eyes out. You know, I was you know, this little gangster sitting in the back row and trying to be macho and not get involved. You know, I say to cry in public, man, that is just so sia soya. This is so embarrassing, you know. So I was holding in, you know, I'm like, but because the, the a feeling that the, the presence of God was so amazing, man, I didn't just sob, I, I didn't just shed a few tears. I began wailing out loud. Right in the corner. <laughs> you know, it was let me tell you it was embarrassing. But I want to tell you one thing. Those weren't tears of sadness, those are tears of joy. It was just so great. And that night itself, I gave my life to Jesus. And ever since, I praise the Lord for that. God had mercy on me. And ever since, you know, I stopped going to the temple. I began going to the church. I began spending seven days a week in the church. I fell in love with the church as a little boy, 12, 13 years old. I would go to the youth meeting. I would go to the prayer meeting. I would join the choir. I would join the old folks uh, meeting. You know, if there's, I would join a Sunday service. If there's nothing to do, I'll go to church. I'll clean the windows. I'll, 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 I'll mop the floor. I'll clean the toilet. I was in church seven days a week. I just love the church growing up like that. But let me tell you also, um, along the way, this is what actually happened. Now, the, the reason why I was big, all right, is it's not just because I was born big, but because I actually suffered from a kind of sickness as a little kid. I was asthmatic. When you're asthmatic, when you have asthma, uh, you don't run a lot. And I didn't run a lot, I ate a lot. That's why I grew big, all right? <laughs> the reason was that. And uh, I still remember when I was um, uh, uh, standard five, about 11 years old, it, it, it went from bad to worse. Uh, I had rather severe uh, asthma. And growing up in a small town, again, I came from a really poor family. I wasn't diagnosed properly, unlike kids today, you know, for those who suffer. Anybody here, you, you have friends who suffer from asthma? You know, yeah, you know this blue puffer that they use? It's called Ventolin, right? It's so helpful. For those who don't know Ventolin, what it does is that when an asthma attacks, your airway constricts. When your airway constricts, you cannot breathe, or you, the, 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 the air can barely get through. This way you get the wheezing sound. <laughs> Because the air just cannot get through. But what Ventolin does is that once you take a puff, it releases, it relaxes the airway so you can breathe again. I didn't have that. Whenever I had an asthma attack, you know, my parents would look at me and say, suck it up and move on, man, and man up, you know. That was it, you know, crazy. We just ran with my asthma, thing like that. But whenever I'm struck with asthma, SOP, okay, standard operational procedure, I will be bedridden for five days, standard. So I still remember at Form 5 when I look at my report card, I actually missed about 60 days of school that year. So basically on average, I was every, every month I would miss about five to six days, so which means every four weeks I would fall sick one week. I was that sickly. Now when I became a Christian, I was still very sickly, right? But after becoming a Christian a few months in, again one of those nights where I felt that man, asthma is coming on and uh, it's not fit. 
feeling great and immediately fever came on I had high fever I was resting in bed I'm thinking you know what this is one of those I'm gonna miss another four days at school standard all right but since I was already a Christian and my sister was already a Christian and she heard that I was sick she came into my room that night and I was bedridden I could barely walk let alone speak um, so she sat herself down next to my bed and I still remember she asked me these two questions she said Victor do you believe God can heal and as an 11 12 year old boy I'm thinking if God can create the universe of course you know for him to heal me this is kacang puti right I mean what's that to God right of course yeah I say yes then the, then my sister turned the question on me and she asked me Victor do you believe that God can heal you now I thank God sometimes we have this what is known as a childlike faith at that point in my life I, I absolutely had that so without a shadow of a doubt I told I looked at my sister and my sister and I said sis I believe that God can heal me so my sister then proceeded to pray for me I said why don't I pray for you Victor so she prayed I, honestly I don't even remember what she prayed something along the lines of dear God and dear father in heaven I want to pray for my brother right now I pray that you heal him remove his asthma blah 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 yadi yadi ya amen I said amen nothing happened yeah, but I fell asleep but you know what the next day when I woke up I was completely healed that was the last time I had an asthma attack my asthma stopped right after that never ever I had another asthma attack it was just like that so this is one of the many gifts that God has given to me when, when I was when I began to know him when I began journeying with God in this life because the God that we believe in is the true God isn't he amen let me share with you one or two more experiences. I'm going to fast forward to present day, all right? And as a little kid, if you remember, if you were listening in closely, um, in t uh, carefully, you would have noticed uh, that I said that I did three things as a little kid, right? I was playing football, I went to the temple, and behind my house was a river. Now, when you have river, when you have kids, and when they're unsupervised, it is an accident waiting to happen. So every now and then, all right? Sagama River does claim lives. Friends of friends have drowned in that river. The very same river that we go and swim in. So if you can imagine with me, that is, oh, oh I forgot to mention, uh, my house was directly opposite the general hospital, right? It's quite a big hospital. There's Maso and Klua. My room was facing Klua. But at Klua, there's a little building there, small building. It was the mortuary. All right? For those who don't know, mortuary is where you store the dead bodies, okay? Because sometimes I see ambulance come in, pew, 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 a little while, you know, if emergency didn't quite make it, and they, they, the, the van will drive across, ooh, and then they'll drag out something, a black bag, and they're going to push it into the mortuary, all right? So if you can imagine with me, I actually live in the Bermuda Triangles. <laughs> something, ha something weird happens there, all right? Because the mortuary, dead kids at the back of the river, and the temple right there, okay? Now, growing up in that Bermuda Triangle, let me tell you, I had my fair share of stories. The place that I lived in was very dirty. Now, I love Asian people because in the Asian community, when I say dirty, I think you kind of, you should be able to understand what kind of dirty I was talking about, right? Okay? I've told this story to some unmoral friends, all right? To them, they don't understand what dirty is. Oh, dirty, just clean it, just wash it, you know? Say, no, 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 no. This guy dirty cannot wash when I say this is this is a different kind. This is the ooh kind of dirty, all right. So as a little kid, I grew up seeing a lot of things that is not meant for kids to see. I bump into many things. Now again, you may think that as a little kid, I may, may it, it may be my in my uh, imagination gone wild or so uh, and so on. But what I saw was in fact confirmed by my second sister. You know, because what happened two years ago, my sister has migrated to Australia. So every now and then she comes home and we had a re reunion two years ago so we we're sitting around a dining table we were chatting about old good old times and so on and out of nowhere my sister told me I said Victor do you remember the old house that we used to live in I said yeah 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 he said I never told you this okay because I didn't I didn't want to freak you out okay but when we were living in a house every time I walk past your room many nights I've seen someone standing next to you all right it's confirmed by my sister now I told you I saw a lot of things and one of the person that I s was seeing regularly as if you're dating all right was <laughs> was this particular guy that would visit me almost every night in my room without fail 
I would say 90% of the time. He would, at about 11, uh, 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock at night, and before he turns up, he's got a great entrance. And how does he enter into my room? He instills fear in my heart. So I'll be lying in bed, and before he steps in, somehow fear would just engulf me. You know, sometimes you watch some horror movies, which I hope you don't, but if you do, please repent. But if you have, <laughs> but if you have, then you know the feeling, right? The, the, the feeling that, you know, the ominous feeling, all right? The uh, premonition, you know, that something bad is going to happen. That feeling would just engulf me, and I know he's coming into my room. And when he comes into my room, you know, I still remember how he looks like. Uh, he didn't wear any clothes, but he wore uh, a pair of red pants. He was bald, okay? So when he comes in, this is what he does. He will spend about 15, 20 minutes with me. He will stand at the foot of the... Um, of my bed, and he would begin taunting me. He would laugh at me. He would mock at me. He would just have a few days with me, and I'll be trembling away, you know. Now, I've suffered from that every single night for many, many years. I told my parents many times. I said, I call that guy Bota. I said, I said, Mom and Dad, Bota, you like kachiao wo la. Kachiao me again. You know what my parents say? Zuo mong la, zuo mong la. This is just a nightmare. I said, "Puss it, Zomo. This is real, you know." Then my parents would say, "This is a quartz. This is just a transition. You know, he's gonna grow out of that." I said, "No, it is real, you know." And like, like, like I said, it was confirmed by my system. And that place that I lived in was really, really dirty because I still remember there was one occasion. It was this was really bad. It was uh, the lantern night. Uh, what do you call that in Chinese? Dongwu jie, is it? Eh, ah, Zhongqiu jie, right? 中秋节, you play the lantern out. Now these days you don't do that anymore. You know, you just use iPad and they just shine the lighter. Back in those days, all right, old school. Okay, old school. Real lanterns, all right. Now, as little kids, we gung ho. You know, instead of playing in front of the house, we went to the river to play. And because that river was mined for its sand, so there, there, diff- there are sand hills at the back. And in front of the sand hills, there are different trucks that are parked there. Okay, because those trucks are used to mm, to carry the sand out to be sold. So I was playing with a friend together. We were lighting all this lantern in the dark. And somehow I felt, you know what, I want to be adventurous. So me alone, I wandered off. I wandered towards the river. Then I was walking into this pitch dark area between two trucks. Okay? I could barely see more than three feet in front of me. Now I still remember this is vivid in my memory. Walking with a lantern between two trucks. This is really creepy, but fun. So exciting. Right in front of me. As I approached the end of the, the truck, I saw a headless body walk right in front of me. I threw it down, ran back to my house, hid under the blanket. You know, I shivered. I don't know if I if I if I peed my pants or not. I was terrified. That was the environment I grew up in, taunted by this all this uh, spirit. Then again, back to my story, I became a Christian, right? Now, when I was a young Christian, I did not know that I could do something about it. So, as a Christian, I was still taunted by this spirit, this botak guy. But three to four or five months in, as I began to go to church and begin to read the Bible, some of the church members found out about my ordeal. They found out that I was being taunted by this spirit. And they taught me something from the Bible. They said, Victor, do you know that this God that you believe in has the authority to cast out spirits? I said, Really? I said, I didn't know that. He said, Victor, the next time you see this spirit come into your room, all right, just say, in the name of Jesus, go. I said, okay, I'll remember that. I'll remember that. Okay, I must do that, okay? So that night when I got home, true enough, Botak turned up. <laughs> this time I was primed. I was ready. I'm going to say it. So as he walked to my room, I was trembling away. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. I did not say it. <laughs> Couldn't bring myself to say it was just too afraid. But you know what? I did not give up. I keep trying. I keep trying. And just a few weeks in, on one fateful night, I said it. He walked into my room. Somehow I managed to mutter sufficient faith and courage to say, in the name of Jesus, go. You know what? He just left. Just like that. Just left. I was in shock. I was in shock, total shock. I didn't see him for many, many years until I was 17. Hey, you know what happened? <laughs> Let me tell you what happened. At 17, one of my 
friends, all right? He invited me to his home, his house, to have a sleepover. I've never been to his house before, but when I went to his house, you know, in Sagama, there are a lot of old buildings, 1912, 1924. It really, it's one of those where you walk the floor with creek. So uh, as I went upstairs, you know, immediately, you know, I had goosebumps, okay? You know, sometimes when you walk into some places, you're like, ooh. It was like that, okay? I said, this place, a bit funny, all right? It's okay, it's okay. So that night while we were sleeping, I don't know what time it was, two or three in the morning, I just woke up. When I woke up, I saw Botak standing at the door of that room. Now, I wonder, maybe he was wandering around for the last three to four years, and he's kind of like, hey, I miss Victor. Maybe I should go and visit him. So he came back and visited me. You know, but let me tell you what happened that night that is so different. I was no longer a young Christian. I was no longer 12 or 13. I was 17. That night, I saw him face to face, eyeball to the eyeball. I had zero fear, 100% faith. I look at him and say, I say, in the name of Jesus, don't you ever come back again. Go. And he left. And that was the last time. Oh, glory be to God. <laughs> we all know as we are believers, we have many stories to tell. We have many testimonies to share. Tonight, I'm sure if I open up to the floor, if anybody has testimonies to share about your faith with God, I'm sure we're going to have a very long queue here tonight. We're going to stay here for the whole night. But I want to skip and fast forward to a little bit. Because tonight is about you. It's about all the visitors who are here tonight. Especially those that if you have never experienced God, or you don't know this gift that God has prepared for us, it's not just for a, an elected few. It's not only for Pastor Victor, it's not only for Pastor Michael, you know, not just for the leaders or some selected Christians or saints. It's for everybody if you do not know that yet. This is a gift that is even so, um, so much more precious than what I've experienced. See, what I've experienced was just an occasional event. They come and they go. It's a gift. It's an amazing gift, but it's nothing compared to this one particular gift that God has prepared for every single soul on this planet Earth. So my aim and my desire and my passion tonight, if you don't know this gift yet, I want to introduce this gift to you. Because at the end of the day, it is up to you if you would like to receive this gift. And should you be willing to receive this gift, you know what, we would have all the time to be praying for you tonight so that when you walk away from this place tonight, not only have you heard my stories, not only would you have heard me singing a song shortly, but you would have walked away with something really precious that no amount of money in the world can buy, yet given to us freely. Now, when I say free, our Asian mindset is that, oh, free is a very cheap one. Lah. No, this is not cheap. Yes, it is free, but simply because someone has already paid for it. If someone gives you a Ferrari free of charge, does that make the Ferrari cheap? No. Since someone paid for it. So this gift that I'm about to share with you is not a cheap gift. It is so valuable. No amount of money. You cannot put a value on it. But God has prepared that for you and I. So it's, whether up, it's up to you whether if you want to receive it or not. But before I share with you this gift, this amazing gift, let me share with you a song first. Is that cool? Amen. Yeah, the applause, so so la, huh? Let's do this again. Would, <laughs> would you like to hear me share a song before I share? Oh, so much better. Yeah. Now, only because you insist, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, just, I came prepared. Yeah. There's this one song that I wrote many, many years ago. Not, not that many years ago, but about seven to eight years ago. It's in my first album. For those who have bought my albums before, it's in the Beautiful Life album. It's called The Gift. It's about how I, I've experienced this gift from God. And I implore people, if you haven't received this gift yet, tonight is your night. You are here not, not by coincidence, not by chance. You are here for a reason. And I believe it is a divine reason why you're here tonight. That you're not out there in the shopping malls. You're not out there playing bowling or something else. There's a reason why you're here tonight. Because God wanted you to be here to receive his gift. Amen. Without further ado, I share with you right now the song, The Gift. Thank you. The time is now for 
use this word same instead. There are many of us who say all religions are the same, right? We hear this so often. Make a tongue tell those yang the mouth, right? They're so familiar with this particular uh, expression. But instead of using the word same, he said they're all similar. Now I don't know if he used that word uh, intentionally or unintentionally, but I thought it was spot on. Now let me explain why. Because if you closely study these two words, you will soon find out that they are not, these two words are not the same, right? Same and similar, they are not the same. It's so hard to explain, right? <laughs> same, when you use the word same, it means that it is an exact replica. It is a carbon copy. It is a clone. There's no distinguishing factor between them. But when you say similar, what, is, what it means is basically that they share some similarities, they have some uh, common grounds, but they're not completely the same. Now, so I thought that this doctor made a really on-point statement. He said that all religions are similar. Of course, we didn't carry on from that point onwards because he had to do his thing. Now, for those who, we hear this so frequently, that one of the top three reasons why people believe in religion, or any religion for that matter, is because they're all the same. We hear this so often. I say, what, what religion do you believe in? Whether you believe in A or B or C, very commonly we hear people say, all religions are the same. But let me, when I hear people making statements like that, sometimes I feel a little bit taken aback because that statement is a bit reckless. I think it's a little bit careless. To hear anybody say, whether you believe A or B religion, it doesn't matter because they are the same, is akin to me saying, the reason why I eat apple and not durian because they are the same. Right? They're not the same. They're similar, yes. They're similar in that they all belong to the fruit category. They both grow from trees. But they're not the same. An apple will never taste like a durian. An orange will never taste like a mango. They are similar, but they're not the same. You guys get me? Let me give another better example. Okay? Let's talk about gadgets a little bit. I see a lot of young people here. When we talk about smartphones, right? Are all smartphones the same? No, exactly. Who said no? It's just not so loud. Uh, so yeah, right? You know, right? But my dad would disagree with you. Many years ago when smartphones came out, right? When just arrived in the market. I said, I got to get my dad this new this smartphone, all right? Gone are the days where you use Nokia 3210 or 3310. If you still remember that, all right? Or, or the banana phone, you know? Those were the old analog days, okay? I said, Daddy, you got to get rid of that phone. Like, I'm going to get you a smartphone so that we can at least, you know, do some Skyping or video calling and so on. But my dad knew so well that smartphones can be really expensive in the thousands, all right? But he's, he's a very traditional old school man. So he said this. He said, get me a cheap one. We'll do, you know, all the same one. But today, if you say this statement to all the younger generations, all the smartphones, same one, like, you know, they're going to they're gonna cast stone at you, right? How dare you say my iPhone 10 is the same as uh, some, um, whatever, Huawei or Xiaomi or whatever, right? Today, you talk to any young people, you say, hey, I want to buy a new phone. Tell me, you know, which is the best in town. Oh, you know, they're going to list all the pros and all the cons. You know, yes, they are all smartphones. But there's so much difference depending on what you want. You want to watch a lot of movies? Let's talk about capacity. You know, you want 512 or one. One, one, one tet, 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 terabyte. Tet terabyte, is that right? That terabyte, yeah, one terabyte. You know, if you're into selfie, then you gotta get this particular phone because you took the, take the four cameras, you know, front and back, eight cameras, all this, the best selfie, make you lose 10 pounds, and make you lose 10 years younger, kind of thing, you know. They know all those things, right? Of course, they are similar, they're not exactly the same. Now, if we would give so much thought to buying a phone, who would just walk into a shop and just buy a phone without thinking about it, without doing a research? Not many, right? Especially if you're spending thousands of dollars for a new phone. You will look at all the specs. You ask the same questions over and over again. If we would give so much thought to buying a phone, why don't we give even more thought about what religion we believe in? And instead, we would just say, they're all the same one. Lah. But in actual fact, we know so well, they're not the same. You don't even have to go to theology school to learn them. You don't have to go to a special school to learn all the differences. You look at Muslim, you look at Islam, you look at Hindu, you look at Christianity, you look at Buddhism, they're all different. They have similarities, but they all have their differences. Christians can eat particular kind of food, the, the Muslims cannot. The Hindus cannot eat certain food where the Buddhists can, so on. You know, there's so many differences. 
So today, this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to spend again the next 30 minutes or so to share with everybody from the scriptures, not my personal opinion, but from the scriptures, what are the similarities and what are the differences. Again, when I say similarities and differences, I'm not here to criticize any religion. I don't believe, whatever reason it may be, for someone to criticize another religion. I think that is done in bad spirit. So whenever I stand on stage, I will share my personal opinion. I will share the differences, but it's never my place to criticize any religion. So what I'm about to share tonight, I'm just merely pointing out the differences so that we are aware. In the case, if you are looking for a religion, or in the case that if, if you have always believed in the particular religion without considering the other religions, tonight is a night for us all to open up our hearts, to consider the similarities and the differences. Is that all right? Is that cool? Now, in order to share about the similarities, tonight we're going to spend our time just, read, just looking up two Bible verses. All right? We're not going to flip the Bible from cover to cover tonight. We're just going to look at two verses. Very simple and like to follow. The first verse we're going to look at, we have the slides ready, is from Romans chapter 6, verse 23. There you are. Now, from here, I'm going to share with you the similarities. We're going to look at the first part. Romans is a book from the Bible, for those who don't know, just in case, all right? And he talks here that for the wages of sin is death. Now, take a moment to pause. What does it mean here? It means there are certain laws in place. Law of nature, in that, if you do something wrong, sin in particular, from a Christianity's point of view, the punishment is death. Now, that doesn't matter what religion you go to or what religion you follow. Every major religion out there will share the same view. If you do something wrong, you will be punished, right? And it has to be balanced out, which means on the flip side, if you do something right, you should be rewarded. Make sense? Recently, someone was having a conversation with one of my friends. A non-Christian asked a Christian friend of mine. He said, he asked, if I can find a man who can do, who has done nothing wrong, he's been good all his life, but he doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, can this person, when he dies, go, go to heaven? What do you think? Yes or no? No, right? I'm going to challenge your answer. I'm going to say yes. If a person is perfect, he or she can go to heaven without Jesus Christ. Really? I have examples for that. Do you know who they are? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, they were perfect. They did not sin. Therefore, they don't need Jesus Christ. They were already in paradise. It's only after we sin, therefore, we get disqualified from heaven. So if anybody asks me today, if I can find a perfect man, can he or she go to heaven? I say, sure, absolutely. But the question is, there aren't any. Nobody is perfect on planet Earth, right? So every religion will agree that. No religions out there will tell their members, you are perfect, you know. You have done nothing wrong. No, everybody has sinned at some point. Let's do a quick checklist. Have you have you lashed out at someone in anger? If you're one of those mild-tempered people, have you been, um, have you had greed in your heart? The Bible says if you covet other people's possession or so on, that is a sin. Have you lied before? Anybody here, you have never lied before? If you put your hand up, that's your first lie. <laughs> Impossible. Everybody lies, right? The Bible says lying is a sin. Now, the Bible even raised the bar. Now, I'm, I'm a man, obviously, speaking on behalf of all men. Now, I'm going to say this up front. I'm going to be really straightforward with you. I believe if you are a man, you have definitely lusted before in your life, right? Yes? If you are a man and you have never lusted before in your mind, there's something quite wrong with you. Maybe you need to see the psychiatrist. Oh, no, no, just kidding, all right? <laughs> but the thing is, as men... We all struggle with that from time to time. The lustful thoughts will come. And the Bible says the minute you think about lustful things, according to the standard of God, you have committed adultery. So at least from a man's point of view, all men have sinned. But sometimes not just men. Women can lust as well. Right? The Bible says if you're angry at somebody else, see, traffic, traffic in JB is getting bad these days, especially when you have sales, you know, and all the Singaporean coming in and so on. You know, and they simply park, double park and everything. You're like, what are you Singaporean? You know, you raise up. <laughs> 
no Singapore is <laughs> You raise your fist and you're like, well, you know. But that, according to the Bible, is murder. You just have to be angry at somebody else. You say, what the beep, beep, beep. You know, I cannot say. That is sinning already. Not just in Christianity. You go to any religion, they will say, you all have sinned. But if you have done something right, yes, of course, you will be rewarded. And in Christianity, when you do something right, at the end of the day, if you, if you, if you make the right decision, the aim is so that we can go to somewhere really nice. In Christianity, we call it, we call it heaven. Sometimes we call it paradise. In some religion, they call it a field of reeds. In Buddhism, we call it nirvana. The aim is that so that these religions will help us at the end of the day that you don't go down, but you get to go up. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming going down is a bad place and going up is to heaven. Now, let me ask you guys, if you get an option to choose between going down and going up when you die, who chooses to go down? Nobody, right? Who chooses to go up? If you get an, Everybody wants to go up. Some people don't know. It's okay. <laughs> you think about it, you will say, if given the options, I think I want to go up, right? That's why we have so many religions. And I always believe all religions are good. Because the intention of every religion is to help the believers to have access to this place up there at the end of the day. So every religion will have their own strategy, their own teaching, and so on. And this ideology is not new. A few thousand years ago, even from the time uh, when the, uh, the Greek uh, people were around, it started way back, four or five thousand years ago. Let me share with you a story. It was about a year and a half ago. I so happened to take my family on a trip, a mission trip to Hong Kong. And we had one free day. And on that free day, uh, someone recommended that we go to the museum because the Egyptian um, ex exhibition was on. So, okay, let's, let's go. So we went to the museum. We went in. I still remember, all right. The minute we walk in through the front door, uh, it was a big screen uh, giving a 8 to 12 minutes presentation on Greek mythology. Now, you can either sit down to listen to that or you can proceed in. Now, most people will just walk straight in because everybody wants to see the mummy. The mummy is like the exciting one, all right, even though it's dead. But people want to see it. Nobody wants to sit there and listen to some oh, screen and boring, boring, boring. I thought, no, 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 we have to do the right thing here. We have to sit down and listen. In the 8 to 12 minutes, I learned something interesting about Greek mythology. See, in Greek work in the in the Greek mythology, this is what they believe in. They believe that when somebody dies, all right, there is this particular god called Anubis. Anubis will come and drag your soul to this place called the Hall of Truth for judgment. In this Hall of Truth, you're going to face this particular god called Osiris, I think, if my, my, my memory serves me right. Osiris is the main judge, but along with him is this a uh, scribe of gods and 42 judges. They will all be there. Now, before you're being judged in this court of a uh, hall of truth, you have to make a declaration. It's called a negative declaration. In this negative declaration, you have to say, I, no, I did not do this. No, I did not do that. I have been a good boy. I have been a good girl. You have to pass all these tests. And at many points in this declaration, you have to say, I have been pure. I have been pure. But if your conscience fail you, you don't even, you don't even get to trial. You get punished straight away. So only a few will pass this first stage. But if you do pass that stage where you say you're pure enough, that you will stand before all these judges and gods, then they're going to take your soul. They're going to take your heart as a representation of your soul and put it on a golden scale. One of those scales, all right? So they're going to, they're going to weigh your heart. On the other side of the scale, now for those who have studied Greek mythology, who can tell me what is on the other side of the scale? It's a feather, right? For those who have followed, you have, you have studied about Greek mythology, it's one white feather. The deal is this. If the weight of your heart is lighter than the feather, they will usher you to this place called the field of reeds, a paradise, so, uh, uh, supposedly. But should your heart be heavier than the feather, what? <laughs> There's something called this uh, Amut. Who is Amut? If you have seen enough Hollywood movies, movies, all right. If you've seen uh, the Mummies series, Brendan 
Fraser, remember those good old days? And the, the recent one is by Tom Cruise. You might have noticed this particular character. He's got a crocodile face, the front of a leopard, and the back of a rhinoceros. He's called the gobbler. The gobbler will come and gobble your soul up. Because in Greek mythology, they believe complete extinction is worse than death. So they just eat you up and you cease to exist. Now, see, all religions have based their belief on that. That in this lifetime, you must accumulate sufficient good things so that your heart is either light or that you've accumulated sufficient good things to offset the bad side. So that's why a lot of religions tell us, so sansu. Go out there, do good things, do charitable things. So that at the end of the day, when you're standing before the judge, the judge will look at you and say, this is a good man or this is a good woman because you've done so many good things as opposed to just a few minor uh, weaknesses or mistakes in life. You guys with me so far? That's what we all grew up with, right? But let me tell you, sometimes it's important to take a moment to pause and to challenge some ideology that you think has been there for ages. Because you'll be surprised to find out some of these things that we believe in are flawed. Now, I believe with all my heart that by doing good things and offset bad things, this ideology is completely flawed. How is that? How is that? Let me give you some example. Today, not that he has, but today, say I somehow caught Christian, my son, stealing. All right? He did not, okay? Hypothetically speaking, I caught him stealing. 10 years old, for the very first time, took, my, took from, uh, from my wallet $50. I said, Christian, how dare you steal my money, right? Of course, he's crying away, but then he backs his case. He said, Dad, Dad, you know what? First time, first offender, all right? He said, but I've never stolen anything for the last nine years in my life. So based on my good behavior for the nine years, can you please let this go? Can you please let this slide? What do you think? Some say yes, some say no, okay? But to give you an even better example, try driving down this road in front of Aeon Mall at 120 kilometers per hour. Stop by the police. The police knock on your window. Wah, tadi cepat, eh? Formula One, ke? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Pertama kali lah. First time, boss. He say. Boleh tak jangan saman? Do you think that's going to work? You tell the police, I've never sped before in my life. Tak pernah. Ini kali pertama sudah pandu kereta tiga tak eh tiga puluh tahun kali pertama saya speed boleh tak? Can you cancel? Use, use my 29 years of good driving to cancel out my this one offense. Do you think it's going to work? Now if that is not good enough, let me give an even more stuck example. Say someone committed murder. Out of rage, they killed somebody. The police caught them, hauled them to court, accused, standing before the judge. And just before the judge pa uh, passes the, uh, the, the sentence, whether it be lifetime imprisonment or death or so on, he makes his case. He said, Judge, I'm 60 years old. For the last 59 years, you know, I've, be, I've done so many good things for the society. I give money to the uh, orphanage. I help out at the old folks' home. I do this, I do that. I'm a good father, I'm a good husband. Can you please consider all my good deeds? and wipe me clean from this one murder that I have committed. In the rule of law, does it apply? Of course not. But yet we believe when we do good, we expect to be rewarded, that when we do wrong, we seem to think that good things can cancel out the bad things. This, anal this ideology is flawed. If you have been believing this principle or this ideology, I implore you to stop. Because this will not get you into heaven. We have to be accountable for all the good things and all the bad things we have done in this life. So don't for a second buy into this and think I'm trying to accumulate. Now, mind you, I'm going to be really fair here. Maybe perhaps, maybe perhaps that we can actually offset, the good things can offset bad things. Let's speak hypothetically, all right? I don't want to be too dogmatic to, to, to keep on to one worldview. But let's say for the sake of argument that good things can offset bad things that this actually works. Then let me tell you, all of us here today, we have a bigger problem at hand. What problem is this? If good things can offset bad things, let me tell you, at the end of the day, a lot of rich people will get to heaven. A lot of poor people, you can go to hell. Now, I sound rude, I sound harsh. Why? Because you see, the rich people, they can give money away to charity, to help other people. They can take time off work. Three months, look at all the celebrities, right? Six months, nine months, they don't have to work. They can go to Sudan. They can go to Cambodia. They can help all to, to the pump water from the well. You don't have to work. But for those who are poor, you can barely have enough money to bring home for your family to eat. You're struggling.
struggling to stay alive, to pay the bills. Now, of course, logically speaking, a lot of rich people is going to make it. Do you think that's fair? But let's go along with this argument, this line of argument. Say it's not about money. Say it's about the heart. So I'm trying to answer every single point of view there is. Some of you may be thinking, Victor, you're talking about money. Maybe it's not about money. Maybe it's about the heart and the intention. That is also problematic. If it's just about the heart and intention, let me tell you, on that day, when we all do get to heaven, because many of us have managed to do sufficient good things to offset the bad things, I guarantee you that you're going to see a lot of people that you don't wish to see in heaven. The uncle who borrowed you $20,000 never paid you back. The mistress who, st who stole your husband and backstabbed you and took your kids away, she made it to heaven. The little boy who always bullied me at school for five years until I, you know, I went to secondary. A horrible kid. Hey, somehow he's in heaven. You think he helps? That murderer is in heaven? That, that con man? Hey, that adult? Seriously? How did that happen? Because they have done sufficient good things to offset the bad things. See, at the end of the day, none of this work because they are flawed. They are a contradiction in itself. You get to heaven and you see all these people that you'll be raising your arm and say, this is not fair. That's why all religions will tell us, in fact, no one can guarantee us a place in heaven. No one. No religion can. They, can, they say you can try. You can try and hope and pray at the end of the day that you, you have gained sufficient brownie points for heaven. You see, in Buddhism, they have 227 rules for men. If you adhere to 207, 227 rules, if you can adhere to every single one of them, you get to go to this place called Nirvana, enlightenment. But if you manage to fulfill 226 and miss that one, you don't get to go. And the sad news is, if you're a woman and if you're a Buddhist, you should know by now there are 311 rules. Don't ask me why, I don't know. I didn't set the rules. But if you're a woman and you're a Buddhist, it's even harder. 311 rules. And no one can adhere to every single one of them. Now, am I poking fun at Buddhism? I'm not, absolutely not. You know why? Because before Jesus came and gave us the answer, Christianity was in the same boat. If, if anything, Christianity was even worse. In Christianity, in the Old Testament, there were 613 rules. Almost double that of Buddhism. That we are called to, to follow every single one of them. And God said, if you can fulfill 613 of them, every single one of them, you go straight to heaven. But no one can. Now this is where it differs. See, the laws in the Bible that were given were not solutions to heaven. No. But they were laws given by God to show us as humans that we are flawed, that by our own strength, none of us can get to heaven. It's to prove to us our weaknesses. Those, that is why the laws were given. Not unlike the ones out there, other religions, they say you try to follow and hopefully at the end of the day you will get there. In Christianity, God made it clear, these rules are not to help you get to heaven. They are here to prove to you that you cannot get to heaven. Therefore, should anybody be able to go to heaven, it is a gift. Let's come to the second part. Look at that. See, so often people get stuck in the, the, the first part of that verse. For the wages of sin is death. Man, oh, we're in a terrible situation, you know. Every religion says, man, we've got to overcome our sins and so on. But we forget the most beautiful part about this verse is the second part. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is a gift. What is a gift? A gift is something that we have never earned. If you earn it, if you work for it, it's not a gift. You can call it salary, you can call it wages, remuneration, reward, whatever it may be, but never a gift. A gift is something that you have never earned but given to you freely. And God knows so well that none of us can get to heaven. So should we be able to get to heaven, eternal life, it has to be a gift from God. Now how do we receive this gift from God? I'm going to share with you another verse and we're going to come to a close real quick. The second verse I'm going to share with you today is from Romans 10.9. How do we get this gift? Now, I want to bring your attention to the last sentence, but let, let us read the whole thing. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. Now, I love that last sentence there, you will be. You will be means that if you do the, one, the, the, the ones above, it's a guarantee. You've got you to go, to go to heaven. You will. It did not say you may. It did not say that you may, uh, you can hope to be saved, or you can wish to be saved, or you can dream to be saved. No, it says that you will be saved. It's a guarantee. So what are the two things that we have to do in order to be saved? Look at that. You got to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. The word, the Greek word for Lord, the original word for Lord is called kudios in the New Testament. Kudios means is actually the uh, Greek word for the word Yahweh from Hebrew. Yahweh means God. But you see, Yahweh has been deemed so holy that people in the Old Testament, they don't even say the word Yahweh. They replace the word Yahweh by Adonai. So when it came to the Greek world, the word to, re to replace Adonai is called kudios. Implying deity. Implying God himself. So whenever we confess with our mouth, Jesus is kudios, we say, Jesus is my God. My only God. One that owns me, one that has created me, one, one that has saved me, and one that will rule over me. That's what kudios means. You believe in your heart. But believing in your heart is not sufficient. Why? You gotta. Ah, oh, I beg your pardon. You gotta confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Believing in your heart, sorry, I got mixed up a little bit there. Believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead is to believe in his divinity. Only God is able to be raised from the dead. So you believe in your heart that Jesus is indeed God. And you confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord. So outwardly you're confirming what you believe on the inside. You need both, internal and external. A lot of people get caught out by missing out one of them. Some people believe they don't confess. Some people confess they don't believe. Let me give you an example. Last year, I was preaching in a church in Ipoh. I was doing an evangelistic concert. And at the end of the day, when everything was over, I was talking to people, and I noticed at the corner of my eye that was this, this auntie, elderly lady, about 67 years old, waiting patiently for everybody to disperse, to leave. When everybody has left, this lady walked up to me and said, Mushu, mushu. Pastor, can you please pray for me? I said, of course, I would love to pray for you. Is there anything I can be praying for you? She said, Pastor, I'm He said, Pastor, I'm very restless recently. I could not sleep. Can you please pray for me? So I, I assumed that she was a Christian already because the, the way that she spoke, asking for prayer and so on and so. But I felt in my spirit that something didn't quite add up. So I thought, just to be sure, I want to ask this lady. I said, Auntie, you don't mind me asking you this question? I said, I just wanted to be sure that are you already a Christian? And she said, yeah, I'm a Christian. I come to this church. I pray and I worship in this church. So I thought, okay, that's fair enough. As I was just about to pray for her, I felt that the Spirit of God prompted in me and said, no, 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 Victor, be a little bit more specific. Something doesn't quite add up with this lady. So I, I, I said, excuse me, auntie, I know I'm being a little bit long-winded, but I want to be absolutely sure, okay? So I asked her, does that mean after I pray for you tonight and everything, and when that you go home tonight, that you're not going to pray to any other gods? She said, no. I only pray to Jesus. Right, fair enough. Right, that's good enough, right? I should be praying for her. But just before I prayed for her, for the third time, the Spirit prompted me, and that was when the Spirit revealed to me what was the issue. Sometimes, you know, when, the, when God reveals something, no man can hide. And this is exactly what came up from my mouth. I said, Auntie, I'm going to be really blunt with you. I felt that the Lord is telling me this. Does that mean after I pray for you tonight, when you go home, that you're not going to pray to Guan Yin? You know what? You know what she said? She looked at me shocked. And she said, Guan Yin can't pray, huh? <laughs> which, means, which means she does. Which means when she goes home, she also prays to Guan Yin. Now, she is a typical case where the mouth confesses that Jesus is Lord. But the heart doesn't believe that this is God himself. That Jesus is one of the many gods. If Jesus doesn't work, I can go to this other God. If this God doesn't work, I'm going to go to the other God. If you reverse the issue, some people believe in their heart, but they don't confess. They say religion and believing in God is a personal matter. It's between me and God. I don't have to confess it. Not, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says when we receive
receive Jesus Christ is not just an internal uh, decision, it is an external commitment as well. That, that's why they have baptism in the past. The minute someone believes in Jesus Christ, the very next thing they got to do is to be baptized. Now, there's nothing magic about baptism. Baptism is so that they can invite the whole village and kampong, everybody, uncle, auntie, atsu, ako, amau, everybody come. Witness me. Witness this occasion where I get dipped into this water, immersed in water. And when I come out from the water, it's a, rep, it's a symbolic representation outwardly of my inner conviction that I've received Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. So today, if you want to receive Jesus, you have to believe, of course. And no one can force you to believe. It has to come from your heart. But once you believe in your heart, outwardly, you have to confess it to your family, to your neighbors, to your colleagues. You cannot believe in Jesus and go home and say, nope, I'm going to keep this between myself and God. That doesn't work. If you do that, you're almost telling God, like, God, you can be my mistress. Right? Have you noticed when you see some movies between the husband and the mistress, have you noticed how they behave in public? They're never seen in public. Right? Always in the dark, in some lorong, in some lane somewhere. Right? So sometimes if we tell people, if I believe in Jesus Christ, it's just between me and God, personal matter. It's as if we're telling God, you can be my second wife. Know why? Because I cannot bring you out to the streets. I cannot tell my friends you are my God. You are my personal matter. Behind closed doors. In the closet. And in recent years, you now we have this term that is regularly being heard. The people are coming out from the closet. You know what that means, right? Coming out from the closet. I want to encourage Christians. We need to come out from the closet as well. Not to declare your, your, your lifestyle preferences. But to come out from the closet to declare our faith. The time has come not for us to recede and go back into our wardrobe and close behind closed doors. It's time to come out and declare and uphold our faith to the world. Amen. So tonight, as I come to a close, I'm going to share with you one more song. It's a song that is very close to my heart. It talks about my journey with God. You know, it's not just all this sharing that I've made up or whatever. These are personal experiences I've had with God over the last 30 plus years. And I really wish for many of us here tonight, if you don't have a personal relationship with God, if you don't have the confidence when your life ends on planet Earth, you don't know where you're going, the best question to ask you tonight is this. Should your life end tonight? Do you know where you're going? That is the question we all need to ask ourselves. If you don't know where you're going, that's where the gift is. That God has said, if you believe in me and confess that I am your God, you will be saved. So as I close with this one last song, when this song is over, we're going to spend a little bit of time in prayer. And I'm going to extend an invitation to everybody here tonight. If you're not a believer yet, if you're not a Christian yet, but tonight, if you, should you decide to receive Jesus as a personal Lord and Savior, I would love to pray for you. So sharing with you right now the song, Every Moment With You.
I want to pray that you get to experience God like I have. Because the God that we believe in is a true God. He's not just a myth. He's not just a person who would who was deified. He was God himself. Now, if that is you, I'd love to pray for you. But in order for me to pray for you specifically, all I ask of you to do is simply one thing. While all his about and eyes are closed, I want to invite you to raise your hand. When you raise your hand, I would invite you to kindly look at me because I will acknowledge your decision. Once I've acknowledged you, you can lower down your hand and I'm going to proceed to pray for you. So I'm going to ask right now, is there anybody here in our midst this tonight that you would like to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? If that is you, let me see your hand. I see your hand there. When you put your hand up, please look at me. I see your hand, young man. I see you, young man. Put your hand down. Yes, miss. I see your hand. You put it down. I felt that you felt something today. I know. I know you've been listening. Don't underestimate that decision, young girl. I'm telling you. Because it is a great decision. You think I'm just putting my hand up. But let me tell you. The minute you put your hand up, God saw your, your heart. God saw your decision. And from this point onwards, God will live in you. It's an amazing decision. Congratulations. Right there. I see your hand. Young man, white shirt, I see your hand, you put it down. Anybody else? Come on, quickly. Wave at me if I, if I have not. Yep, the lady there, and right there as well. Anybody else? You can put your hand down. Once I've acknowledged your hand, you can put it down. Anybody else? You know, there's actually quite a few of you. This is what happens. When I see a few hands put up, you know, the church wants to celebrate with you because this is an amazing decision you're making here. If you did put your hand up, you know what? I want to personally shake your hand. I want to personally pray for you. Now, if you don't mind, if you did put your hand up, I want to invite you to come forward. Quickly. Well, it's been two minutes. I'm going to pray for you, and that's it. If you did put your hand up, you don't mind to make your way forward. Come to the front here. I want to personally shake your hand and pray for you. Come to church. Let's give them a big hand. Come on. It's right here. Look at this. This is my son's classmate. First time to church. He's the first one. Who else? I saw a few hands go up. Don't be shy. If a 10-year-old can do it, you can do it. Come on. Now, I'm not trying to pressure you. Don't get me wrong. I'm not, I want to celebrate with you. We want to celebrate with you. If you did put your hand up just now, I want to encourage you to come forward. Come on, just give them a big hand. Come on. Come on, don't be shy. I won't bite. I promise I will, I will not bite you. Okay. Come on. Miss, you don't mind? You want to come forward? Your friend, come on, accompany her. If your friend brought you to church, come with her. Did you come alone? Did you, you came alone? No. Nope. Come, stand with her. Okay, just stand right there. And the few over there, come on. We only have one or two minutes. Come on. You don't mind. Come forward. I want to shake your hand. We want to pray with you. If you did, put your hand up. There were six or seven over here. We are one big family here. Really, we are. You are my brother and sisters, all right? So if you did put your hand up, again, I don't want to force you, but I really want to encourage you to come forward. Come on. If you, come, if you can come forward in front of all these people, let me tell you, on that day in heaven, God will acknowledge this decision because he would say you were brave enough to admit me and to confess me in front of public now in front of millions of angels I will acknowledge you that's what the Bible says so if you did put your hand up come on one last time I don't want to force you but if you did put your hand up please come forward join these two lovely people will you come on I know you're almost there I'm just giving you a little bit of encouragement come on behind you no you're not ready to come forward there you are. See, young man, let's give a big hand. Good. There you are. Good. Come on. Come on, come on. Lie, 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 lie. Be up. Let's stand here. All right, I'm going to pray with you. There, there's another one there. See, sometimes we just got to usher them a little bit, okay? God bless you. God bless you. Very good. Very good. Okay. How you, how you, the, come on. Okay, one last call. One last call. Okay, one last call. Those who put your hand up, come on, please. I want to, sh- I want to shake your hand. I want to get to know you. Can you, ma? Can you come here? I want to ask you a question. Okay, that's fine. I'm not going to force it. It's okay. But meet me after the service. Now, for these four people, these four brave souls who came forward, you know what? I want to say first thing, congratulations. Church, let's give it a big hand. Let's pray. We're going to pray together, okay? I'm going to say a sentence. I want you to repeat it after me. You can close your eyes, but make sure your heart is open. Because this is a prayer you're going to invite Jesus into your heart. Is that okay? Church, let's pray with them. Say, Dear Father in heaven, I thank you tonight that I've gotten to know Jesus and his gift. I 
open up my heart right now. I receive this gift. I receive Jesus as my Lord, my Savior, and my God. I ask Jesus to forgive all my sins. Wash me clean from all the bad things I've done in the past. From today onwards, I'm no longer a stranger. But I will be called a child of God. I will believe in Jesus. I'll follow Him. I'll worship Him for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. And you say, Amen. Amen. Come. Welcome to the family, guys. And for those who did not come forward, that's okay, that's fine. You can meet me after the service. I'm more than happy to pray for you. I've exceeded my time. Tomorrow, yeah, we have two more services. On Sunday, there's another service. I'm preaching on something else as well. But you, if you do have a friend, they've been dying to get them to come to church, I want to encourage you. Bring them along, okay? Um, and there's a great message in store for them. Now, without further ado, I want to hand the time back to Pastor Michael uh, to close up for the uh, service. Let's give Pastor Michael a big hand, shall we? Thank you. Amen. Amen. Pastor Victor, Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, do do consider to come if you are uh, not coming or I really would wish that you would come for Saturday and Sunday. Invite someone. Uh, when Pastor was praying, making the altar call, I want to uh, either speak to the parents here or to the young people. It's one thing I want you to know.
And this happened in 1988 in Armenia when an earthquake happened and the building collapsed. A mother and a daughter was trapped under the rubber. And they were trapped for a few days. And because the, mother, the daughter was very thirsty, later they, they, it was reported. And the daughter was very thirsty, keep asking the mom for water. But there was no water, they were trapped there. And the mom couldn't do anything. But then the mom suddenly realized that the only water that she has is her blood. And so she had to make a very strong, uh, a, a, a very definite decision. Because of her love for her daughter, she decided to cut her finger and let the daughter suck her blood. For her, she felt that she's old, she, she will have to die. And so she would rather die so that the daughter can live. And so she cut her finger, let the daughter suck the blood. And after that, the daughter still says she's thirsty and she cut her second finger. And she cut all her finger just to keep the daughter alive. And she was really prepared to die. But, praise the Lord, four days later, they found them, both mother and daughter. Mother was seriously ill by then, but then she survived. I, I'm sure when we hear such a story, when I read the story, it gripped my heart. And, and I, I, I really can feel, I, I, I feel that the mother shouldn't have, wouldn't, we, we shouldn't want to see anybody go through that. We can feel the pain, we can feel the love, we can feel the sacrifice, something connect with us. But today, I'm sharing this, it, it, it's not just about feeling for a fellow human being's love for her daughter or the willingness to sacrifice because of that love. I'm sharing this to, 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 to remind us and I know that it is already in our heart. That's why we are partaking of communion because we recognize the love of God for us. 2,000 years ago, Jesus did not just cut his finger for our life. He gave up his entire life. He was crucified on the cross so that his blood can pour forth and then cleanse us from all our sins. So that through his blood, by the giving of his blood, he gave you and me eternal life. We, by having faith in that, by receiving the gift of that blood from him, we receive eternal life. And so today, we want to prepare our hearts for communion. As I invite the leaders to come, Yang is going to lead us with a chorus. And we are going to prepare our hearts. And I think it's just only appropriate that we come and we remind ourselves that, that the cross, that the cross is about the love of God. We must see the motive of that cross. We must see the motive of that sacrifice. As we, as, we, as we prepare our hearts, we want to tell God, God, I want to see beyond that cross. I want to see you send Jesus to die on the cross. It's because of your love for me. Because you love me. I think it is of crucial importance that Christian constantly remind themselves of the love of God for them that was proven on the cross 2,000 years ago. We must not forget that. And I think that is the reason why Jesus told us that we must do the communion as often as we can. He wants us to remember the love of God as we remember him. He is the manifestation of God's love for us. He is coming to this earth to live, to die for our sins, 
to resurrect, to give us that hope is, is all motivated by God's love. And I pray today, even as we prepare our hearts, even as we prepare our hearts, even as we sing the chorus, as we sing it unto the Lord, I pray we all will just take these few moments to focus on the love of God and be assured of the love of God and that there shall be no more doubt in our hearts about the love of God because, because the love has already been demonstrated 2,000 years ago. And God does not need to demonstrate to us again His love for us over and over again. I want to say this to some of us here who may need to hear this because you are doubting the love of God. And God said, don't doubt my love. I have already, I have already shown you how much I love you. Why are you still doubting me? You are not to doubt me. I have already shown you my love 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, sending my son to die for you on the cross at Calvary. That is the greatest gift that I can give to you. No other gift that I can give you today can compare to that gift that I give to you. The gift of my son through whom salvation now comes into your life. The gift of my son through whom now not just eternal life but abundant life is your heritage and your destiny. Oh, hallelujah. Today as we come, come with a heart of gratitude. Come with a heart to say, Lord, I thank you. Come with a heart of faith that, Lord, I will receive your love. I will receive your power. Tonight, we hear a powerful testimony from Pastor Victor. Testimony of healing, testimony of deliverance, testimony of spiritual authority. And many more. And many more. video that we watch is about the freedom Today, as we partake of the communion, as we remember Jesus, we remember the graces that He brings along with Him to those who believe and trust in Him. And you are the one who believe and trust in Him. And therefore, you have every right and privilege to receive the divine blessings that come through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's sing to the Lord. Let's sing to the Lord. The young will lead us. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.
hold on to your word. We hold on to your goodness. We hold on to your truth. We hold on to your nature. Lord, I thank you for your children here today, as they have come on this very auspicious occasion to come on this Good Friday. Lord, you will honor them for their faith. You will honor them for their commitment. You will honor them for their love for you. Lord, you bless this emblems as we partake of it. We will remember you, your goodness, your love, your power. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Let's partake the bread together. Let's drink the cup together. And now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's give him the glory. Let's give Jesus the glory. Amen. 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 Please stay back for some fellowship. We have refreshment.